Hey, if you're into the reptile hobby, chances are you've had a conversation with someone and the topic of morphs has come up. So to someone new in the hobby, this genetics and morphs, they can all be very confusing and you don't want to feel embarrassed and ask. So today, I'm just going to cover genetics and what it all means. Welcome to Classy Herbs. Okay, to kind of demonstrate this to you guys, I'm going to use ball python. This is a normal ball python, so what you need to understand that this is what they look like in the wild. It's kind of just a brownish, blackish color, just some normal patterning. This is what they look like in Africa, and they are found in Africa, right here. Now over a long period of time, uh, in the wild, these random genetics have kind of just popped up, and people have found them, ball pythons like this, in the wild that look just not normal. Okay, here is an example of an unnormal one. Okay, so this right here is also a ball python, the same kind of snake that I just showed you, which is that normal wild type one, this is also a ball python, but this is a different kind. They call these morphs when they're different skin colored. It's like a paint job. It's really cool because there's so many. This is actually what they call a piebald, and you can see that it has some white and it has some coloring, but its coloring is also different. This is just one of the hundreds of morphs that are available on the market today. And these things just kind of popped up in the wild. It's about a one in a billion chance that this could happen. And, but we captured them and brought them into captivity. And by selective breeding, we've been able to make some really cool things that probably would never occur in the wild. Now, just to make a point that there are so many kinds. This is also a ball python. This is a super pastel. Butter. Exanthic and a pinstripe. So now I'm just going to try to quickly explain to you how all this works and how you know what you're going to get. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to explain how genetics work. Alright, so what I've drawn out here is a Punit square. Okay, the N stands for normal. Okay, this is a normal again. Just what they look like in the wild. No mutation genes. Okay, so the two out here are the mother and the father. Either way, it doesn't matter. Alright, so this N is the mother's, they each have two genes. Each, the, sorry, the N and the N come together here to make a normal. Come together there to make a normal, come, these, they kind of fall in line. And so you can see out of that clutch, breeding a normal to a normal would give you a clutch of 100% normals. Okay, now let's introduce some mutated genes. This PN on top is means it's a pastel. This P stands for pastel. Pastel is a co-dominant gene, but just a normal pastel with one pastel gene has one pastel gene and one normal gene. Say we breed it to a normal, which has two normal genes. These fall in line, you'd get one pastel, two pastels, and then these ends come in line and you get 50% pastels, 50% normals will be your odds. Let's take it a notch further and say you bred a pastel, PN, to another pastel, PN. You have a 25% chance that these two pastel genes will hit on the same animal, giving you a super pastel. I don't have, actually have a pastel, but I'll put a picture up for you so you can see what one looks like. Okay, so we say we got this 25% chance and one of our ball pythons hatches out super pastel. This is a super pastel. You can see it has two pastel genes in it, which make it super bright yellow. Very pretty. Our other options in this, pastel to normal, you get one pastel. Another pastel to normal, you get two pastels. And then the two normal genes line up on the same animal, so you get one normal. So you get 25% super pastel, 50% pastel. 25% normal. Not bad. Let's say we raise up that super pastel that we hatched out, which would be this, as two pastel genes up here, and then we just breed it to a normal, two normal genes. Now I'm demonstrating this to show you the powerhouse that super genes are, and those are only with co-dominance, okay? Not all animals can be made into a super form. But let's say we bred that super pastel to normal. Pastel gene lines up with the normal on all of them. So you get 100% pastels breeding from a normal to a super pastel. Alright, now let's move on to a little bit further into stuff. This is an exanthic. This is an example of a recessive gene, which means it has to have two of the both, both 
exanthic genes in it to actually be visible. If it only has one, like just the pastel would have, then it, it would look normal, but it would still have the exanthic gene in it. And they call those het, because it's short for heterozygous, meaning different. To demonstrate this, I drew out this next, another primate chart. This AA stands for exanthic. It has to have two to be visible. If it's not, it's heterozygous. We bred this to a normal, two ends, okay? So the AA and the, uh, the A and the N line up on each one. It gives it an A, gives it an exanthic gene and a normal gene in each baby. It's 100%. And if it has a normal gene or any other gene besides exanthic, has to have, it has to have two exanthic genes to actually look exanthic. Then all of these babies are heterozygous or het for exanthic. Okay, so this is what uh, two het breeding together would look like. Say this A represents the exanthic gene and this N represents the normal gene. Same over here, A exanthic and normal. So if it has one exanthic gene and one normal, like I just said, it still there, but this normal gene has dominancy over it, so it just goes behind. This animal looks completely normal, but it is there. So I'm going to fill this in, how to do it. You see this A lines up with this A, and you can write an A, A. Over here, this one N lines up with that A, so A, N. And A, N, N, N. Alright, so what we got here, from a het to a het, we have a 25% chance of getting that exanthic. If it has both exanthic genes, then it looks exanthic, nothing het about it. It's homozygous, meaning same. So that, that is a visual exanthic. This one here is both, so it is a het, both, it is a het, and this one here is normal. But the thing about this, which can be kind of tricky, is since this het, that does have the exanthic gene, and this normal that does not look both normal, you can't tell these three apart. They all look exactly the same, so there's no way that you could tell which one is which. That is why getting into heads is tricky, and that's where trust comes into the play. Do you trust the breeder if he says it's 100%? If he's, Most breeders will tell you that it's like 50% head or something like that. If it is, and you're taking your chances, but hopefully you get this one and not this one. To help you kind of understand recessive genes, just kind of think of it as it's still there, it's just kind of hidden behind the dominant gene, which is dominant over it, so it's not there, but it is there. It's just hidden behind the dominant genes that are in it also. But if you got it from a trustworthy breeder and he said it's 100%, then the gene is there. This is an example of a het. This is actually a het clown. But you can see that it looks no different than a normal ball python. But it does have the clown gene in it, because clown is recessive, meaning that this animal was, its parents were, a clown bred to a normal, which gave it one normal gene and one clown gene, making it look normal, but it still has that clown gene in there. So if I bred it to another heterozygous, then I would have 25% chance of making a clown if those two clown genes in them lined up. Okay, so there's a third type of gene. This is what they call just dominant. There's a lot of different morphs that are just dominant. And this is a good example of the pinstripe, which means if it's dominant, it is not, it only has to have one gene to be visible, unlike recessive, which have to have both. But dominance, the difference is between dominant and codominant, dominance do not have a super form. So if they both line up in the same animal, it makes no difference, it's the same thing. We can use this as an example. This is a pinstripe. See, the pin represents the pinstripe gene, and then N represents the normal gene. A pinstripe has one normal gene and one pinstripe gene. So this is a pinstripe bred to a pinstripe. You see the two P's line up, but that doesn't make it a super pinstripe because it's only dominant. And so, that is just a normal pinstripe. This is also just a normal pinstripe. You can't tell the difference between this one and this one. They look the same. And this is also a pinstripe, and then you also have that 25% chance of hatching out a normal. So again, this is a butter. It's actually also a co-dominant. If you breed two butters together and they line up, which you have a 25% chance of it, it makes a leucistic, a blue-eyed leucistic, or an all-white snake. Those are awesome. But let's say we bred her to this pinstripe here. Okay? So this is going to represent this. Butter, it has 
because this is just a normal butter. If it had two butter genes, it would be all white, but it's not. So we have one butter gene and one normal gene. And the pinstripe has one pinstripe gene and one normal gene. So let's say these pinstripe gene and this, and this butter gene line up, and that gives it one butter gene and one pinstripe gene. And those are designer morphs, and those are a bit, this is the next level up. That's why ball pythons are so awesome, because you combine morphs and make whole something new. They call those jigsaws, and those go for a thousand dollars up, and they're really awesome. Your other combinations here is butter to normal, the genes line up, you get one butter, genes line up, one pinstripe, and you also have that 25% chance of just a normal. Alright, so this week's pup of the week is, I'm just going to kind of show you just a basic albino rat. This is an albino, pretty much to put it. I'm showing you this so you guys can see in the future the, uh, the different kinds of morphs, or not morphs, but um, different colors compared to what just a little albino looks like. That has been your pup of the week. Just to demonstrate that it's not only in ball pythons there's morphs. But this is a leopard gecko. This is what they call a tangerine tornado leopard gecko. He's actually in shed. But you can see he's very orange. Here's a picture of a normal. You can see the difference. This is also a different type of morpha leopard gecko. This is what they call a blizzard. This is actually a recessive gene. Alright, and guys, really, that's just scratching the surface of the morphs. I mean, those are just the basic base morphs, just one gene. I showed you one example where you can combine them, and you can really just build off of one gene and you add another to another, and I mean, you can get like five, six morphs in the same animal, and that is why the reptile, in particular right now, ball pythons, are so popular, just because there's so many things, and you can just keep piling and getting bigger and bigger and better animals and they're just really amazing to work with and you can make some absolutely stunning paint jobs alright like always see you guys next week Colin's out it's time for the weekly comment contest so today we have shown you a lot of more so different people have different opinions on whether it's right to breed animals for their color should we just leave them all so they look normal like they would after that this week's comment contest of the week is would you rather breed animals for their color and why? Please leave your comment down below for a shout out next Monday. Last week's comment contest question, which was you rather breed your own rooms and buy them, was best answered by Airsoft Ghost Squad, who said, I prefer to pay you because it would be a whole lot easier, and I don't have a lot of room either, and because you are awesome. Yeah, and pretty awesome. See you guys next Monday. Good.